Welcome all of you to this live program at Albury Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Wolf Peterson from Berlin, Germany. Professor Peterson is the director of orthopedic department at the Martin Luther Hospital in Berlin, the Academy Hospital of Charity. He specializes in sports trauma, osteotomy, and arthroplasty, and certified by the German Knee Society. He's a past president of the German Knee Society and vice president of the German Sports Trauma Society, and also serves as a board member. He's also the chief editor of the Knee Journal and serves on the editorial board member as for operative orthopedics and trauma, and also in arthroscopy, the journal of the EGA. He's the chairman of the upcoming 10th Berlin Osteotomy course for 2023, and is also the chairman for the 13th German Arthroscopic course for 2023. He has published widely and has more than 400 PubMed index publications to his credit. And if you notice, Dr. Peterson has delivered a lecture on a channel that's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Professor Wolf Peterson for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this very nice uh, introduction. And it's a big pleasure to talk about ACL injuries uh, today because ACL is one of my favorite uh, topics, scientific and clinical topics. And it's a pleasure to give you an update. What's new in 2023? What, and what new means for me? What have we learned uh, during the uh, past five years? But I will also talk about what's known um, already. So, okay. My presentation does not move forward. Prof, you can use the cursor. On the, yeah, perfect. Oh, yeah. So now if you have your iPhone, yeah, you can use it during my talk because I will, during my lecture, I will provide you some QR codes like on this um, on this uh, slide. Um, here, yeah, here are the QR codes uh, where you can get to my Instagram uh, channels, uh, my personal channel and the channel of the International Knee Academy. Um, but it will also provide QR codes of current papers or videos uh, uh, which you can uh, yeah, download uh, to intensify yeah, the, 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 the study of, of, of these topics. Okay. Um, this uh, is the structure of my, of my presentation. I will first talk a little bit about injury mechanism and prevention then indication and management of ACL injury, then a little bit about surgical technique and uh, yeah, last but not least about rehabilitation and return to sports. Let's start with, our, with the injury mechanism. Look to this video. This video shows the typical injury mechanism. I can repeat it. And here we see that it's quite often a landing a jump then the knee has a valgus collapse or a valgus position with low hip and knee flexion. And the center of gravity is always behind the knee. And that means the center of gravity behind the knees uh, means that you need an eccentric quadriceps contraction to stabilize the knee. And in this position with low hip and knee flexion, the hamstrings are less effective. And the valgus um, the valgus position means that the, 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 the ACL becomes stressed. And this quadriceps course um, is suitable to um, induce an anterior tibial translation, which can cause an ACL rupture. And those video analysis initiated uh, um, the story of ACL injury prevention, um, and this is, was already 30 years ago. Motion analysis have shown uh, that some, pe uh, some people or some patient or some, some athletes um, uh, display this critical motion uh, or show this, this, uh, this critical motion patterns um, with hip abduction, the dynamic uh, valgus and the foot in, in, in external rotation. And this was the rational yeah, um, that scientists try to um, try to modify uh, these motion patterns by prevention strategies um, by neuromuscular training programs. Uh, one example is a famous uh, FIFA 11 plus uh, program um, 
there's scientific evidence that this program works and also for the German uh, Stop X program, there are programs from Norway, um, other programs from the United States. And when you look to the evidence, then we see that the evidence is overwhelming. This meta-analysis shows that with these uh, injury prevention programs, you can reduce knee injuries by 26.9% and you can reduce ACL injuries by 50%. So what's new? New is that um, we have today uh, nice technology um, to do screening for patient at risk. We have these variable sensors and these uh, variable sensors or, or with the use of these variable sensors, the risk factor screening becomes uh, um, um, more, pre more practical. Um, and uh, this uh, variable, uh, moreover, this variable sensor technology allows to evaluate at risk pattern also in the on field situations. This is a very new study um, from the group around uh, Ali Gokola, Paolo et al. It was published um, this year. And uh, these authors use variable sensors to um, examine the players or the athletes on the field um, to find out if they have uh, in the, the real life uh, motion or in the real life um, movements. Uh, display these uh, injury uh, or risk uh, risk factors. And on the other hand, we have uh, these machine learning techniques or um, artificial intelligence techniques. And um, we have also seen that with these current machine learning method, it can, these can be used to identify athletes at risk. And these can be very helpful to detect the most important injury risk factors. And um, I think, or I believe that with these machine learning methods, um, we are able to uh, to examine or um, or to find out uh, risk factors more uh, more rapidly uh, in comparison to these uh, to the, the the history of thirty years of prevention uh, scientific uh, um, prevention uh, strategies. Uh Okay, let's talk about indication and, and management. Um, first, let's talk about the ACL injury and risk of osteoarthritis. You see here the X-ray of a patient 44 years after non-operative therapy. You see an advanced medial osteoarthritis with, uh, where the joint pain is already gone at the medial side, and it's quite typical that uh, uh, osteoarthritis with ACL reconstruction starts on the medial side. Um, but on the right, you see in, um, an image also with a medial osteoarthritis, but this patient had ACL surgery 15 years ago. It's not as severe, but uh, with uh, as severe as on the, uh, on the left side, but with this image, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is surgical treatment may be useless uh, because some patients develop osteoarthritis despite of surgical treatment. And that was yeah, the research question for this um, consensus process, it was a consensus process initiated by the ligament committee of the German Knee Society. And the question was, um, can we prevent um, osteoarthritis by ACL reconstruction. And it was a complex uh, consensus process and you can download the paper here with a QR code. Um, but we found out that, or we could demonstrate that um, the osteoarthritis is not only caused by the chronic instability caused by ACL injury, it's much more caused by associated injuries of the primary knee trauma, such as cartilage injuries, such as meniscus injuries, or other peripheral ligamentous injuries. And furthermore, the risk of developing an osteoarthritis is um, 
um, is also mediated by uh, pre-existent um, risk factors such as various deformity or an increased posterior slope. So ACL reconstruction can only prevent this chronic instability and it can therefore can only prevent secondary cartilage and injury, I mean, uh, injury and meniscus injury, which contributes to osteoarthritis. Um, it's more important to treat um, those, the, the complete knee injury with the associated cartilage and meniscus injury in an appropriate way and to address AC injury and the associated injury. Let's look to some associated uh, injuries on the lateral side. Uh, you can see here the, the typical notch sign or the posterolateral fragment, which are impression fractures of the, uh, of the bone. You can see also here the displacement of the lateral meniscus, and we very often see lateral meniscus injury associated with the, with the ACL, such as root tears of the lateral meniscus, but we can also see lateral capsular ligamentous injuries, such as the anterolateral -lig ligament injuries. And this combination of those four injuries uh, can be called the lateral quartet. On the medial side, uh, we can also see medial meniscus injuries in the acute setting, but they are more prominent um, or more frequently um, seen in the in the in the chronic setting. Um, in the acute setting, we have to be aware of these ramp lesions. Uh, a ramp lesion is a specific type of medial meniscus lesion, which consists of a meniscal capsular tear here at the meniscal. Um, a ligamentous junction, but this injury or lesion can be very difficult to diagnose arthroscopically um, when, when, we, when you just look from the anterior compartment. Um, um, therefore, we have to put our scope through a transnotch portal or a posthumedal portal to visualize uh, these injuries uh, accordingly. And it's not a, although although it's very popular to talk about root lesions uh, today, these lesions have already been have already been described in the 80s by Michael Strobel, and he uh, called them ramp lesion because um, this is a so-called meniscus ramp. But what's new? This French uh, or, or working group from France um, showed that we can repair. Those lesions very well with these all inside uh, um, devices. Um, and um, the overall failure rate is pretty well, only 77.3% uh, uh, in comparison to 20% of, uh, of the failure rate of, uh, um, of, uh, of other meniscus lesions. So the, the failure rate after uh, ramp repair is maybe. Um, less than uh, after um, and repair of other meniscus lesion, but we have a failure rate uh, or, uh, or a higher risk for failure when we use all inside devices than uh, using these suture hooks, uh, which you can see here on the uh, on this uh, image. And the next question was, um, yeah, how? Yeah, how should we treat our uh, patient, or um, how should we treat? Tre we treat this was part two of our uh, consensus uh, process, and the question was uh, how should we treat these associated injuries in comparison, uh, in 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 combination with the ACL uh, injury, um, and um, in part uh, two of this uh, in the consensus. Uh, project, you can also scan the QR code to um, read uh, the original paper, which was published in, in the KSSTA. Um, we developed this treatment algorithm, um, and this treatment algorithm should guide you through the management of the acute, um, uh, acutely injured knee. So we have four different phases: the phase of morphological Diagnostics, then the phase uh, of conditioning, 
the phase of functional diagnostics and then um, the therapy, finally. And the question of this consensus uh, process is, um, should we need early or delayed optional surgery? Now, let's start with the process. Um, in this phase, we should perform an MRI to find out if we have an ACL injury or if to uh, find out if we have even a knee dislocation, uh, which needs another therapy, which is a definitely, uh, um, a definitely another a completely different entity. Um, so in the following, I will just talk about this low energy, energy trauma with an ACL injury. And if we have a repairable meniscus lesion, then this meniscus lesion is an indication for surgical treatment. And we recommend to perform the ACL and the associated uh, meniscus injury in one stage because the uh, meniscus uh, has a much better healing potential when we perform it in combination um, with the ACL. Here you can see a typical bucket handle, medial meniscus tear in combination with the anterior cruciate ligament injury. And this is definitely a, an good indication for surgical repair. And in these cases, I do both at one stage, ACL reconstruction and surgical repair of the meniscus. The next condition is a proximal lesion. Proximal lesions have a good healing potential. And uh, during the last years, we have seen many studies that have shown that um, refixation with anchors or um, bracing with fiber tapes or um, um, or other augmentation techniques have the potential um, to heal these proximal uh, lesions. So therefore, um, a proximal lesion could also be uh, an indication for more or less acute uh, surgery. Yeah, then let's look to the associated um, ligamentous injuries, uh, um, especially the medial collateral ligament. And uh, yeah, we, we divide uh, according to the severity, uh, the, the MCL lesions to in grade one, two, or three. The grade one and many grade three uh, lesions too can be treated conservatively or non-operatively with a brace, which can you, you can see here on the right side. But when we have these distal lesions, which is a so-called stena-like lesion, um, then we should be, uh, should be careful with conservative treatment uh, because um, you can see here the, the hamstring tendons. And in many of these distal lesions, the uh, uh, SMCL slips over the hamstring strand, uh, tendons, and then um, these uh, injuries uh, cannot heal uh, to the bone. Therefore, uh, the distal lesions are seen as an indication for surgical treatment and refixation here below uh, the hamstring tendons with a metal anchor. Um, and I try also to, to do these uh, repair techniques in combination with an ACL um, um, with an ACL reconstruction. And other grade three lesions are um, these complete uh, ruptures of the uh, MCL and the whole posterior medial complex with the MCL and the POL. But um, these, uh, if you have a grade three lesion, then um, you definitely, uh, or in most cases, um, have a, a, a knee dislocation, which is definitely another um, another um, injury than this uh, this ACL injury due to a long low contact uh, knee injury. Okay, all other injury ACL injury um, um, can be treated non-operatively. Um, we should do a so-called prehabilitation to condition the knee, treat the effusion, the pain, the range of motion limitation, et cetera. And then after maybe six weeks, um, the patient can be tested or after eight weeks, 
or maybe after 10 weeks depends a little bit on the patient on the athlete on uh, on the knee you can do a so-called copa non-copa test a very uh, important uh, criterion are the so-called hope tests which should be more than 80 percent but there are two patient reported outcome measures such as the coach uh, activity of daily living score or a global knee rating score and another criteria the fourth criterion is if the patient has more than one um, giving way episodes and if there is one of these uh, criteria are positive then it's probably a non corpor and uh, um, in these patients we should uh, also treat surgically and all other uh, patient or athletes are, they can be considered as, as copal and they can continue with neuromuscular um, training. And other factors are age, activity, cartilage damage, and uh, legs access. But when they, during this training or in, during sports activities, develop giving way phenomenons or uh, secondary meniscus lesions and they should also be uh, scheduled for surgical treatment so this is the management algorithm uh, i hope and i hope that this algorithm is of of help for you uh, last year um this in my opinion pretty interesting study has been published in the lancet uh, this is very interesting but this is because the lancet is a high-ranked um more general medicine um, journal, but it's yeah, it's a quite popular journal. And um, these authors um, uh, uh, compared surgical reconstruction of patient um, with a non-acute ACL injury with, with persistent symptoms of instability, which are these patients from our algorithm. And this study, this prospective randomized study showed that if we operate on those patients or if we perform surgical treatment in those patient, um, patients, um, this treatment is clinically superior and more cost-effective in comparison um, to rehabilitation alone. Interesting study. It's also um, uh, an open access paper. You can download it. It's very worth to read. Um, I can recommend it. Um, fortunately, I have no uh, QR code, um, but you can download it uh, from uh, from the internet. Yeah, this, these are the therapies. Non-surgical is in your muscular training with perturbation training, strength training, and jump training. Um, and surgical treatment, the surgical treatment of choice is the anatomical ACL reconstruction. Um, so... Now I come to the surgical technique. I will first talk about patient-specific graft choice, then about anatomic ACL reconstruction, then the remnant preserving techniques and treatment of associated uh, injuries. Yeah, let's talk about graft choice. The most uh, popular graft in the past were the bone patella tendon bone graft and the semitendinosus gracilis graft. Here you can see a patella tendon bone graft, and here is semitendinosus um, tendon graft. Bone blocks, that's a patella tendon, semitendinosus. For both grafts, we have many, um, many very good studies uh, which show that you can get a stable knee and good patient reported outcome uh, um, measures with both grafts. With the patella tendon, we have much more donor side morbidity uh, than with the semitendinosus tendon. Um, therefore, the semitendinosus or hamstring tendons got more and more popular during the past years. But the BTB is still a good uh, good graft option, especially uh, for um, for high level athletes, uh, because the re rupture risk is a little bit less than um, the reabsor risk of the hamstring tendons. A new graft, or it's not a new graft, but um, the, the quadriceps tendon has 
got more got more ex uh, um, attention uh, during the past years. Um, this is a quadricep standing graft um, here with a bone block, but you can also use this uh, graft without bone blocks. And um, there's a, a systematic review uh, from Moabes uh, at, and co-workers, and they have shown that the quadriceps tendon autograft had comparable clinical and functional outcomes and graft survival rate as compared to BTB and hamstring tendon. Therefore, it's a very good alternative to these uh, graft. Um, and when we compare it to the bone per tendon tendon bone graft, uh, the cardiceps tendon graft showed significantly less harvestite morbidity, such as harvestite pain, compared to the patella tendon. And in comparison to the hamstring tendon, the, the quadriceps tendon graft showed better functional outcome. Therefore, uh, in my opinion and in my clinical practice, this is a very good alternative to both uh, other graft options. Here's the comparative studies from, from our group, has been published uh, last year. Uh, we included 50 patients and compared quadriceps tendon bone versus hamstring tendon. The quadriceps tendon uh, graft was uh, the femoral fixation, was a breastfeed uh, fixation. And in this um, study we found no difference in KT 1000 arthrometer, pivot shift tests, who subscale scores, Lucerne score, or re rupture rate. Um, but there are um, there are some some indications uh, I think for each graph. This is also an interesting uh, study by Runa. This is an, an Austrian or a group from Austria. They included as much as 875 patients and they found that the need for revision surgery was 2.7 uh, times higher or greater in patients receiving in hamstring tendons than uh, uh, compared to a quadriceps tendon graft um, and this um, is probably because the flexor tendons protect the ACL and if we sacrifice the flexor tendon, uh, we sacrifice uh, probably a protector um, of the ACL. In, uh, in, uh, on the other side, if we weaken the, the, the quadriceps by removing a graft from the quadriceps, we weaken um, the agonist uh, or the antagonist to the ACL because we learned in the beginning of my talk that the force of the quadriceps tendon can be sufficient uh, to harm the ACL. So the big question is, do we need uh, different grafts um, or, or um, is one graft type enough and every surgeon should concentrate on, on, on one graft to get familiar with, with the graft um, to get a good outcome? In my opinion, a good ACL surgeon should be familiar with Every graft, every every graft um, he gets. We have different patients here: a high risk um, athlete, uh, handball um, athlete. He is definitely at high risk. Um, other another group are uh, here: children. Uh, children are also uh, have, a, have a high uh, ACL injury or rupture risk. And on the other hand, we have these. These athletes um, who do jogging or, um, or, or play um, tennis and um, yeah, these uh, activities are not uh, not the highest risk for in a yeah. Therefore, um, these higher risk athletes, when we look uh, back to to the Runa study um, and look back to, to this lower re rupture risk. So I think these um, uh, athletes or these patients are a good indication for a quadriceps tendon graft. This is uh, a system, an, an, another systematic review and meta-analysis about uh, um, ACL reconstruction in children. And um, in this systematic review or meta-analysis, we um, 
found also um, that the, the re-rupture risk was much higher for the hamstring tendons here with 13% in comparison to the quadriceps tendon here with 6%. Therefore, we conclude that children are also a very interesting patient group for, for these quadriceps grafts because we can use the quadriceps tendon graft without bone block. In the previous uh, slide, I showed you a quadriceps tendon graph with a bone block. This is a quadriceps tendon graph without bone blocks. And because of those uh, results, the re rupture um, rate was only half of that of the hamstring tendons. I think the children are a very good patient group um, for a quadriceps uh, tendon graft. Another indication could be medial collateral ligament injuries because this uh, study of Mirko Herbert from Munich um, has shown very, uh, very nicely um, that the hamstring tendons um, play not only a role for, uh, flect, for fl knee flexion or for ACL protection. No, they play also a role um, for stabilizing against um, valgus rotation. So they support the medial collateral ligament. Therefore, um, um, the ACL or the MCL injured knee um, is also, in my opinion, uh, a good indication to leave the hamstring tendons intact and to use a graph from the quadriceps uh, tendon or from the patella tendon. Yeah, let's talk about um, drilling technique um, or about anatomic ACL reconstruction. My definition for anatomic ACL reconstruction is tunnel placement within the original insertion of the ACL. And one way to achieve this is uh, to as a drilling technique because we learned that the, with the transtibial Drilling technique, it's much more difficult to reach the anatomic um, ACL uh, insertion because we learned that the ACL insertion is not at the roof. Here in the 12 o'clock position, it's more at the tunnel wall of the lateral femoral, femoral condylis condyle here in the 11 to 9 o'clock position. Therefore, we recommend um, or the middle portal drilling or independent drilling technique is recommended by most um, ACL surgeons uh, for ACL reconstruction. And um, um, two years ago, uh, this Greek working group um, about Michael Hentes uh, have published a meta-analysis uh, to compare tibial, transtibial drilling techniques and um, intermedial portal techniques and um, they show clearly that in single bundle ACL reconstruction the intermedial portal technique was much superior uh, in comparison to the transtibial drilling technique uh, based on physical examination scoring systems and also radio, uh, radiographic results there were more reproducible anatomic graft placement positions compared um, uh, with the uh, transtibial technique and the intermedial portal technique here you can download um, this paper. It's, it's worth to read, I think. The next trend in ACL reconstruction is the remnant preserving ACL reconstruction. Here are the advantages of this remnant preserving ACL reconstruction techniques. Um, with this technique, we protect the graph from the synovial fluid. Um, because uh, we know that the uh, synovial fruit can be harmful for tendon remodeling. Furthermore, we seal the bone tunnels to prevent inflow of synovial fluid, which can cause uh, tunnel widening. Uh, and, and by covering uh, the tendon, we have a better run uh, with, uh, with uh, intact uh, or more or less intact ACL uh, tissue. We have a better uh, tendon remodeling because we have a direct ingrowth of blood vessel from the uh, from the ACL remnants to the graft, and uh, in in the the, the non-remnant ACL reconstruction, um, 
the the whole blood supply must come from from the bone tunnels therefore tendon remodeling is much better in these uh, acl remnant preserving techniques and furthermore we could uh, preserve proprioceptive elements this is also a meta-analysis by Wang and co-workers, and um, they found um, that with the remnant-preserving ACL uh, reconstruction technique, we have a significantly better stability with regard to pivot shift and, and Blachmann test and KT-1000. And they found uh, that we also have uh, a much better results in the Lusheim score. Um, in the remnant preserving technique in comparison to the non-remnant preserving techniques. Um, in my clinical practice, the remnant preserving technique um, is the technique of choice when I perform a cell reconstruction. I think um, that this was the most, I think the most powerful at, um, development uh, technical development in ACL reconstruction in, in, in the last year. Some people um, argue or have concerns that there might be a, a higher um, rate of, high, of cyclops lesion or um, extension deficit. Um, and here you can find uh, uh, a study of my colleague um, Sebastian uh, Birke. Um, we published it last year in the Journal of Orthopedic um, Surgery and Research. And in this study, we found there's no increased risk of cyclops lesion or cyclops formation or development of extension deficits in the first year after remnant um, ACL augmentation, ACL reconstruction. Um, and uh, in this study, the return to sports rate was even higher in the group of remnant uh, augmentation. Um, yeah, when you are interested in the uh, in these techniques, uh, here I provide you QR codes uh, of videos um, of the um, quadriceps of my quadriceps uh, um, ACL reconstruction technique with the press fit technique, also in a remnant preserving technique, and here is a video um, of my hamstring technique, uh, also remnant preserving. ACL reconstruction. You can download um, these QR codes, go on YouTube and watch the videos if you are interested uh, to learn more about these techniques. The last point uh, uh, or the last slide uh, in the technique section is uh, about associated injuries such as the anterolateral injuries. Uh, we learned a lot uh, about anterolateral instability during the last uh, years um, due to a landmark paper of Stephen Clays. Um, yeah, he showed a structure which he called anterolateral ligament. This is indeed a tiny uh, ligament structures on the lateral side of, of the knee. There's a big debate if it's more a lateral a lateral ligament or it's a lateral anterolateral complex. Um, uh, it's difficult to get a final conclusion, but uh, we learned uh, during the last year, if we have patients at risk, which are, of course, um, revision cases or which are athletes, then you get a much lower uh, Really rupture weight when uh, you augment your ACL reconstruction with an anterolateral, either anterolateral reconstruction, which is performed by a tendon graft, autologous tendon graft, a gracilis or semitendinosus uh, tendon graft, or in so called anterolateral tenodesis, according to Limer here in this uh, example. Um, and uh, here we take a stripe from the tractus or iliotibial tract, um, then we pass this iliotibial tract stripe below or under the anterior so lateral collateral ligament and uh, pull it into a bone, a femoral bone tunnel here. You can download 
Um, my personal uh, technique for this anterolateral tenodesis, according uh, to Lemaire. Uh, so this is also my preferred uh, surgical techniques. And these are the indications for an additional anterolateral stabilization, pivot shift, very marked pivot shift, revisions, or high-level athletes. So this is an um systematic uh, review and meta-analysis about this topic and this study showed that compared with isolated acl reconstruction combined acl reconstruction with anterolateral articular procedures anterolateral reconstruction or lateral extraarticular tenodesis led to improved pivot shift grades and graph failure rates and a limited marginal improvement in subjective function score was observed in patients who underwent an, um, an, an anterolateral procedure combined with an ACL reconstruction. So the conclusion of these authors was that uh, when there's a need to improve rotational stability or subjective function, an anterolateral procedure, either an anterolateral reconstruction or an anterolateral uh, on lateral exarticular tenodesis um, should be considered. You can also download this paper if you're interested to read it. Yeah, then finally, uh, uh, we come to rehabilitation and return to sport. Um, what have we learned about uh, these topics? Yeah, we know, or that graft remodeling, we can divide graft remodeling in different phases, the early healing phases, remodeling phase, and maturation phase. And the problem of this early healing and this uh, remodeling phase is um, that uh, the mechanical strength of the graft decreases due to cell necrosis, loss of cells and structures, and more importantly, because of this revascularization, because when the vessels ingrow into the new, um, new ligament or the, the tendon graft, um, they have to degrade collagenous uh, tissue or extracellular matrix. And this remodeling process or degradation, tissue degradation, causes that the graft decreases its mechanical strength. Um, then during the maturation force, the mechanical strength of the graft increases again. And um, depending how long these phases um, are, you can start then with, uh, with activities. The big question is, because all these um, um, basic science studies about graft remodeling were performed in animals and in animals the early early healing phase was only a few weeks and the remodeling phase was some months and the maturation phase took from three months to uh, four years but in the last years we learned a little bit more about, about uh, this remodeling because this is here a systematic a review. And you show that depending on the, on the study, uh, and we found that in the human, these uh, remodeling phases are much longer than in, in the animal. And uh, when you look here to the remodeling phase here between six and 12 months, remodeling phase here between six and 12 months, and here even the early healing phases in between six and 12 months, um, you can see that this is yeah, the, the time point or, or the time frame when we um, allow our patient to, to return to sport. When we do return to sport, um, assessment or or we we perform our return to sport decision just based on time and uh, in clinical practice this is the case when when you look here to, from uh, on uh, here here are results from the german bundesliga which is a german premier league soccer premier league um you see that the majority of players came back to sport here in between 6 and 12 months and this when we look to these um, um, 
uh, basic science studies, uh, these are biopsy studies from human uh, grafts, then we see that this is the phase when the graft is very highly at risk. Yeah. Therefore, in this phase, the knee needs perfect neuromuscular protection. So the, the muscles around the knee must be in a perfect state to protect your graft from further injury. This is a study from, from Netherlands, from Nikki van, uh, van Melik. And um, yeah, this group tried uh, to design or to, to, uh, to create a practice, to, to create, create evidence-based practice guidelines for ACL rehabilitation. So they investigated 90, more than 90 studies and um, based on those scientific results, they concluded that rehabilitation of uh, ACL injury should include not only a post-operative uh, uh, period, but also a pre-operative period, period, the so-called prehabilitation or conditioning, um, as I uh, showed you in our um, treatment algorithm, and then after ACL reconstruction, a th three criterion-based postoperative phases. So a so-called impairment phase, a so-called sport-specific training, and then the return to play phase. And to move from one side to the other, uh, from one phase to the other, is based on certain criteria such as strength tests, hope tests, quality of movement, and also psychological tests. And they concluded also that the post-operative rehabilitation should continue for nine to 12 months because many newer studies have shown that um, in between the first year, um, when the when athletes um, come back to sports during the first year, they have a quite high risk uh, for re-rupture. And they furthermore um, concluded that um, to assess readiness to return to play, the patients should perform a test battery, including strength tests, hop tests, and measurement of movement quality. And this prospective um, cohort study by Grindem and Engelbretson, this is a Norwegian uh, US uh, um, a group, and they performed the prospective court studies of 213 athletes and followed them for two years after ACL re reconstruction. And then uh, they wanted to find out if, um, if return to uh, sports test batteries or criteria make sense, if uh, there's definitely scientific evidence for that. And um, they are Return to sports criteria were mus muscle strength measurements, single leg hop tests for distance, crossover hop tests, triple hop tests, and the six minutes uh, or the six minutes timed hope, and also patient reported outcome measures. And the return to sports uh, criterion was in lower limb asymmetry index for each of these um, um, criteria. And um, these authors could show that passing the return to sports criteria was independently associated with a lower risk of second ACL injury. So we also published um, um, a so-called return to sports algorithm, um, also in uh, cooperation with the ligament injury committee of the German Knee Society. And in this uh, algorithm, we have also three phases of rehabilitation. And these phases are from nine to 12 months. And after this time, we should check the, the knee for some basic criteria, such as effusion, Lachman test, stability, KT1000 if available, pivot shift, and range of motion. And if we um, have a pathological finding in those basic criteria, we should do further um, diagnostics, such as an MRI, 
X-ray or maybe also a, a CT scan. And if we have abnormal findings such as a cyclops lesion, lesion or abnormal tunnels, bone tunnels, we should think about new surgery, maybe an arthrolysis um, to resect the cyclops lesion or even, even revision if we have wrong, wrong bone tunnels. But um, if we have normal findings uh, um, in these basic criteria, we can go for, for hope tests strength tests uh, and uh, tests for from um, movement quality. And if we have an, a lower limb symmetry index of more than 90%, uh, we can advise our athletes to go back to sport. If we have less than 90%, then they should continue with rehabilitation. So in conclusion, um, injury mechanism and prevention, the main injury mechanism or injury um, is the non-contact injury. Main risk factor is the so-called dynamic valgus. But we learned that uh, prevention of dynamic valgus and even ACL and knee injuries is possible by new muscular exercise programs. Indication management, osteoarthritis after ACL rupture is essentially determined by accompanying uh, injuries. Uh, for example, the, the meniscus injury and uh, indication for early surgery is uh, seen in patients with associated meniscus lesion or distal MCL lesions. All other patients can be tested can can be tested for COPA and non-COPA uh, criteria, but also age and activity are different uh, indication uh, criteria for surgery or non-surgery. Surgical technique: the anatomic ACL reconstruction is a technique of uh, of choice or uh, state of the art with portal drilling, portal view. Then I think um, the remnant preserving technique has also much advantages um, over non-remnant preserving techniques. I've shown you um, some paper about that. And we should also treat associated injuries such as the menisci, but we should also address anterolateral structures if they are injured. And what have we learned about re rehabilitation and return to sport? Um, yeah, there's much agreement in the literature that we should uh, go more for a criterion-based rehabilitation instead of a purely time-based rehabilitation. The rehabilitation time should last at least 9 to 12 months um, because of the high re-rupture rate within the first post-operative year. And uh, we learned also, and there's now scientific evidence that these return to sport test batteries are effective um, to identify athletes who are at risk for a second ACL injury. Thanks for your audience. And uh, now it's a pleasure for me to invite you to an um, on-site meeting here in Berlin. So save the date for next year, the International Knee Days here in Berlin. Hope to see you there. Bye. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof, you can stop sharing. Thank you very much, Professor, for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. And uh, mm -hmm. let's have a short Q&U. Prof, uh, Prof, can you hear me? Yeah. Prof, uh, what is the situation with the abnormal posterior slope? Suppose a patient comes with an increased posterior slope or even a reversal of slope. So do you think a slope altering osteotomy should be performed initially before going in for an ACL reconstruction? Uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, I would be careful... If, if I have a primary case, in revision cases, it's an, 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 posterior, an, an increased posterior slope about more than 12, millimeter, uh, 12 degrees would be an indication for me. In, in a primary ACA reconstruction, maybe posterior slope more than 15 or 16 degrees. And then the situation, if we had maybe 
previous injury on the contralateral side. In for all other cases, I would be a little bit more careful. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. I, I, I agree. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, we have Lloyd as well. Us. Yeah, hi, sorry, guys. Uh, I, I, I think we asked this question before. The answer, I think, the, this, is no, this is no black and white answer for such a question. But the answer is just the slope should be addressed in revision cases. Don't address it in the primary cases, if, even if there's an increased slope for them. But the question is for Professor Peterson. Would you add, or when would you add the LET, uh, lateral lend, um, uh, tenodesis for a primary SEL? Would you choose it for the certain players or would you preserve it as well for the revision cases? No, I, I do it more frequently also in, in, in athletes, high level athletes or um, um, yeah, um, handball players, soccer players, basketball players uh, who are really at risk for a second ACL uh, injury. Do you add and, on top of that LAT or, or? I, I do this, this LAT that I showed LAT. you. Yeah, in, in, uh, in primary cases. Yeah. Prof, uh, yeah, yeah. Prof uh, especially when we're talking about high level athletes, do you think a BTB? Or a hamstring, or a, I mean, sorry, a quadriceps would be a better choice. Of course, yeah. So, which one would you prefer, BTB or quadriceps? I would prefer quadriceps, um, but BTB is also a good choice. Um, it depends a little bit on your on your practice experience, um, but I would prefer quadriceps because of the lower donor side mobility. And uh, are you concerned about the length of the quadriceps tendon? Because sometimes you, you may find it short. And do you recommend taking a bone block of the patella along with it? I, I always do it with bone block. Just in children, I do it without. And I, all of you who are interested, you can go to my uh, YouTube channel. There's a technique um, I show you there, uh, or I have a video of my quadriceps technique. Where I use bone blocks um, even with a press fit technique. And this is one another advantage of the bone block. One advantage is you get a longer graph with it, but um, you can use a bone block for press fit technique and then you need, need no implant um, at the femoral side. So it's another advantage in my opinion. And what about the debate between suspensory versus an interference? Uh, fixation. For example, do you use a loop device or a screw device on the femoral side? I use a loop device at the femoral side. Um, a very simple flip tag or flip button um, with with a adjustable uh, loop. Um, but you can also use these uh, self-adjusting adjusting loops as uh, such as a uh, um, tightrope, for example. Um, I try to avoid screws at the femoral side um, because I've seen some cases where the screws uh, harmed um, the graph when you screw it in. So that, that could be uh, one problem uh, um, with screws. Therefore, I, I use uh, loop devices at the femoral side and, and button interference screw at the, at the tibial side. And do you think there's a higher chance of a laxity when you use a suspensory fixation compared to screws? Slight difference in laxity? No, I don't think so. Okay. And Prof, you mentioned about the cyclops lesion. So when do we actually suspect a cyclops? Is it post-surgery or prior to surgery? Is it Can you get a cyclops even before surgery? You can also get a cyclops uh, before surgery. Um, it's, it's, just another, it's another pathology because when you get it before surgery, it's, um, these are mostly the, the, the fibers of the old ACL which impinge uh, in, in the anterior part of the, of the notch. But um, from my experience, the cyclops lesions after ACL reconstructions are graph bundles, uh, ruptured graph bundles. Um, and they uh, can also then impinge um, in the anterior part uh, of the notch. Uh, one, one tip just to you know, minimize the risk of developing cyclops is to deprive the tibial tunnel 
carefully around and take the tissues down just to avoid uh, any new tissues formation at that place and that might uh, cause cyclops. So the idea is to, to, uh, to clear out the tissues around the tibial tunnel. Well, are you done with the questions, uh, Hitesh? Yeah, yeah, a lot you can continue. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Professor, uh, Professor Peterson, again for the wonderful presentation. And thanks again for this is a brilliant idea, adding the QR codes to, to the to the slides. So it's way more easier now to find. And Prof has uh, some really, yeah, Prof has some really great videos. Idea, right? Yeah, really great yeah. videos on YouTube. I recommend everyone to That's have a look into I think we need to visit him uh, next year. I think we need to visit him <laughs> next year in Berlin. So I'm, I'm coming to Göttingen in May. I might give him a visit. Anyhow, regarding the ramp legion, my advice is, I did, I did a new scope today. Yeah, there was a ramp legion as well. But my advice is to use a 70 degree scope. 30 degree scope, I couldn't see anything. Switch to 70, it lightened up all, all, all the way to all the corner. It's way more easier. To, uh, to see around, especially the posterior medial um, compartment uh, by using the 70 degree scope. Uh, one of the question is, do you, regarding the drilling technique, is do you use all inside a technique or do you use, it, use the uh, standard one uh, inside out? What do you think, Professor Peterson, about that? Um, yeah, do you think I, there's I, a difference in the healing rate in the, when you use all inside? Like a flip cutter. Yeah, I use my I use a, a really really simple standard technique, uh, a middle portal drilling technique. I I use it now. I think, yeah, fifteen years ago, um, I I started with this technique and. I'm very happy with this. Uh, no difference technique. So <laughs> I I. So no, uh, this is no. the message that I wanted to de deliver. There's no difference between these techniques. The the companies now, the firma, they are trying just to marketing their instruments, like, such as flip cutter, would say just to use it. Well, at the end effect, you are using, you are doing ACLs uh, maybe for the last 30 years. I didn't find any difference in healing rates. Anyhow, one of the uh, question we're talking about is the meniscus. Would you, oh, sorry, uh, it, it, the quads, the length of the quad that you need. I would say the maximum length that you need six to seven centimeter of the length of the quads tendon, which is easier that you can, which is a bit easy to get it. And uh, in this moment, I would want to thank uh, Dr. Peter McDonald, who exposed me to uh, harvesting with th all three, uh, three um, uh, tenders, the quadriceps, uh, hamstrings, and BTB during my fellowship in Canada with him. So I was exposed to the three to these three techniques, and I'm more confident now to do the quads. I shifted more to quads. I felt that the harvesting is way more easier. There's uh, the core morbidity or harvest side uh, morbidity is less. Patient is able to go back to to his let's say to his back to daily activities maybe quicker and they will not will not sometimes when you take the um, hamstrings they will still end up with some sort of numbness or even when the uh, weakness uh, when they flex their knees up uh, above 70 degrees so i think quad tendon is uh, trending now and you can you can have a good bulk a good uh, thickness of this at least 10 millimeter when you do ha harvest it and even some people say, oh, I'm afraid to take the full thickness of the quad. It's not the end of the world. Even if you take the full thickness of the quad, that's no problem. So you can still close it. And I, by the way, I use, uh, do, what, how do you close the defect? Do you use a scorpion for the, to, to close the defect or? No, just, just a, a, a simple continuous. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I would use the scorpion just to uh, uh, do a running switch up for that. Uh, the question is for, would you preserve, or, or when you do, when you add ACR repair, would you, or when you, in, if there's a patient with ACR rupture, would you send him for physiotherapy first for the six weeks, or would you intervene immediately? No, no, then uh, I, you should intervene immediately. This is an indication for more or less acute within the fourth, first three weeks. 
what, what did you do you think that the studies have sh showed that when you intervene immediately there's a risk of uh, stiffness i think um i think the risk of of stiffness was maybe a problem of bone patella bone ACL reconstruction during the 90s. Mm. I, I, I do not see many stiffness cases after ACL reconstruction with, the, with these um, modern rehabilitation uh, techniques with early extension and uh, early quadriceps activation. Yeah. And, uh, with these anatomical techniques, um, uh, with with anatomic tunnel placement. Gotcha. Yeah, no, one, uh, one, just, uh, just a minute, yeah. just one question, uh, with, uh, just to make uh, the audience clear about that. Prof, what is your time generally when you have an isolated ACL injury? What is the recommended time that you do surgery? I mean, what is it, when do you intervene? At which week? Like first week, second week, or up to six weeks? It depends on the associated injuries. If I have an, um, a meniscus injury, which should be acuted, uh, uh, treated uh, more or less acutely, then I would do also the ACL reconstruction uh, in combination with the meniscus repair in the acute phase. Um, or if I have this distal MCL lesion, um, and then then I would also combine it with with the ACL surgery. But um, for all other cases, you can wait for six or, or eight weeks. And um, in my experience, um, it's the, the ACL surgery with regard to the remnant uh, mm -hmm. preservation, it's, it's, much, it's much better if you have more time um, from injury. Um, because if you have a fresh ACL, then the collagenous fibers are spliced and you you have to remove uh, some of them to get a better overview and uh, but in the chronic lesions they there is a continuous structure um of the remnant and um, mm -hmm. it's much easier to preserve it uh, yeah. Loy, any more questions to bro um i think i think that's it uh, it is uh, thank you professor yeah. yeah thank you professor for this uh, very comprehensive presentation and I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. And we really look forward for another one in the future. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, Prof. Uh, the, 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 the date for September 2, uh, 2024 will be there. Perfect.